So it's only the next almost century, you know. Very mutual. All right, well, welcome everyone to today's webinar. We are super excited to welcome you to the 75th anniversary webinar series of Counseling Psychology. Happy birthday, Counseling Psychology. Yay. <laughs> my name is Annalise Singh. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs are awesome pronouns for me. I currently serve as the president of the Division of Counseling Psychology. I wanted to give a shout out to the land uh, and really a recognition and honoring of the land that I'm working on. I work in the uh, territory of Muscogee, Crete, and Cherokee uh, nations uh, on land that was often unseated. So it feels really important to me to share that and give an acknowledgement to the many indigenous people that still steward this land today and uh, gave good steward to the land for hundreds of years. Um, I also just want to welcome you to our theme for our webinar series, which is really about kind of building a counseling psychology of liberation and really looking ahead uh, to our future. So we're excited to have that conversation tonight. I, uh, it has been an honor to work with our uh, steering committee um, of the formerly Counseling Psychology Conference. I'll be dropping their names into the chat box just to thank them for all of their hard work. And I have to tell you, it's been a very deep honor to work alongside Julia Phillips and Carmen Cruz, who are just like sisters of my heart and siblings that I'm so glad I've been able to work with for almost two years. So we are gonna get started. You are in for a treat tonight. I am gonna turn it over to Carmen, who is gonna let you know a little bit about the purpose of this webinar series. Yes, hi everybody, we're super excited to be here. Um, some of you, just to kind of ground us in what is CPC, the Counseling Psychology Conference is held every six years generally. There's been some variation in that once in a while, but generally every six years. And it's sponsored by three organizations, by obviously Counseling Psychology, Division 17 of APA, by ACTA, and by CCPTP. And those are the three organizations that Julia, Annalise, and I um, are serving and putting together the CPC 2020. Um, so we couldn't celebrate together. This opening would have been very different. Um, and it's really sad to let it go. And it is what it is, right? We're learning a lot of acceptance in these last 10 or 12 weeks. Um, and so really wanting to start with thanking so many volunteers, so many presenters, so many reviewers, our committees. I mean, so many people that made up what CPC 2020 was all about. And, you know, we really just appreciate you giving your energy and your talent so much. And even though we can't gather, we're gathered here tonight. And this will also be historical, her historical, their historical, and on the internet forever, right? On the YouTube Division 17 page. <laughs> so it's important to celebrate. So we cannot let the 75th anniversary of counseling psychology go uncelebrated, right? So we got together and we thought, okay, so what are we going to do? At the very least, we wanted to bring you parts of CPC 2020, right? And celebrating the 75th anniversary of County Psychology is really important. And so we thought, what are the things that we can offer in this sort of new um, COVID life um, while we're navigating all of this together? And the first thing, of course, was our opening, which is tonight, which is with these wonderful people that we have here to have this panel discussion to talk about the past and the past 75 years of counseling psychology, the present and where are we going, right? And that's what tonight is about, is to be really grounded in, in those three aspects of our lives as we usually are. So tonight is the presidential panel. In June, we're gonna be having Dr. Bettina Love. So make sure you get your reservation for that. That won't be recorded. And so there are only 500 spots for that webinar. And then the, the third in the series will be in July, which is a panel of black trans activists that so we're gonna join us in New Orleans. So we're really excited about the whole webinar series and um, just super happy to be here and serve all of you. So I will bump it over to Julia who will introduce our panelists. Okay, thank you. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, okay, and of course I've now lost my document. These are the good times of Zooms, and as there we, we know, we're just flowing with it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so starting off, our first panelist is Dr. Sandra Schulman. She's a managing partner of the Columbus Office of the Executive Management Group, an international leadership development and consulting firm. 
She teaches leadership at the HEC School of Business in Paris, Doha, Beijing, Shanghai, as well as at Duke University. Dr. Shulman chaired the APA Good Governance Project, which focused on aligning APA governance with its strategic plan. I'll never forget her keynote talk at the 2014 International Counseling Psychology Conference, in which she talked about the need for leaders to be flexible and adaptive in increasingly dynamic times. Clearly, as president in 2020 of the American Psychological Association, she is a living example of adaptive and visionary leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our second panelist is Dr. Melba J.T. Vasquez, a psychologist in independent practice in Austin, Texas. She also practiced at the University of Texas Austin Counseling Center, where she served as internship training director. Dr. Vasquez was president of multiple divisions in APA, including our own SCP, a co-founder of the National Multicultural Conference and Summit, and the first Latinx woman to serve as president of the American Psychological Association in 2011. I would like to highlight her leadership on one of her APA presidential projects, which left a lasting impact on the field of psychology by focusing our attention on the complex intergenerational challenges and triumphs experienced by immigrants and immigrant families. Mm -hmm. Next, uh, Dr. Rosie Phillips Davis is our third panelist. She is Professor of Counseling Psychology at the University of Memphis, where she previously served as the Vice President for Student Affairs and as Director of the Counseling Center before that. Dr. Davis was President of SCP, a co-founder of the National Multicultural Conference and Summit, and President of APA in 2019. Thus, she is currently serving as past President of APA. Those of us who participated in her Deep Poverty Initiative as APA president are forever changed as a result of her leadership and raising awareness of what it is like to live in deep poverty in the United States. Our panel will be facilitated today by Dr. Brandy Pritchett Johnson and Dr. Linda Forrest. Dr. Pritchett Johnson is the Director of Clinical Training and Assistant Professor at Wayne State University as well as founder and executive director of the nonprofit Future for Teens. She's joined by Dr. Forrest, Professor Emerita, and past associate director for faculty outreach at the Center on Diversity and Community at the University of Oregon. So much gratitude to each of you for being here today. So please take it away. Oh, my heart just started pumping really hard. <laughs> like, oh, this is for real. And those introductions of our panelists just overwhelms me with pride and joy and a little bit of pressure um, and excitement. I am overjoyed and excited and so humbled to be here. And I, oh, I just see my student is in the audience. Shout out Kimberly Stokes. I have to do that. You know, we have to do that. Um, and I, and I, so there are a couple of things I want to do tonight to help orient us into this, this space and this place um, in time. And that is first and foremost to acknowledge all of you. I see Chicago in the building, well, figuratively speaking. I see Austin, I see Savannah, Georgia, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, North Dakota, Columbus. I mean, I am overjoyed that even though we can't meet in person, we are able to connect and dare I say fellowship, if that's your language, virtually. Um, so I'm going to send good energy to all of the bandwidth for our internet tonight and that it does not rain on our parade. <laughs> I have excitement and then I also carry a little bit of rage and a little bit of pain. And so I wouldn't be me if I didn't make sure that we acknowledge and recognize the, the murders and the malicious and ill-intended acts that is per persistent in our country today. And the only way to do that is to do that in acknowledgement of the names and the identities of the people that we have recently lost. I will call the names with great um, pride of George Floyd, Ahmaud Archery, Breonna Taylor, and the countless others that we continue to lose and mourn 
And while I think most often we take a moment ex of excitement, or not excitement, but a moment of silence, I apologize for that. I think what feels most authentic for me is a moment of rage. And I am pissed off, and I know many of you are as well, and I think that we have to create space and place for that. So with that said, may you grieve and process in whatever way makes sense to you. And on that note, um, tonight is about community and celebration. Celebration of life and activism and leadership. And so I want to set the tone for how are we going to do this. And I need your assistance to do it and we will move on. If you would be so kind as to in the chat box, share with me what your quarantine, isolation, television watching has consisted of. What are you watching on television right now? Keep it real. I know some of y'all are watching The Bachelor. <laughs> I know some of you are watching The Ozarks. Okay, that's just me. I know, what are you all sitting on your couch watching on Friday night and Saturday night? Oh, yep, yeah, the Ozarks, 90 Day Fiance, The Office. Oh, what a classic, right? Scrubs, Top Shelf. Oh, my goodness, Top Shelf, Insecure. I want you to take the opportunity to sit back, relax, get comfortable, get a snack if you need one. You might need a tissue or two if you feel so moved and really engage in this experience as if you were watching your favorite show and you had the opportunity to interact with the cast. We are going to have a good time and you're going to have the privilege of gaining the inside scoop to the conversations of these three incredibly influential and phenomenal and dynamic women, change makers and leaders in our field. I will remind you, utilize the chat box to engage with one another, ask each other questions, share your experiences. There will be times throughout tonight where we bring that into the conversation. And then please craft your questions and place those in the question and answer box, which we will also address later. So now that you're comfortable, can we get started? You ready? You ready? Buckle up. Okay. Let me get my cheat sheet. I would like my first question that will set the tone and I would love to hear from all of you is to take us on a trip down memory lane. We want the inside scoop. Take us to that moment when you decided to run for APA president. What was that? What was it that pushed you or pulled you to go for it? And what assisted you in making that decision? If you would be so inclined, please share your most notable victories and challenges during your presidency. And keep it real. <laughs> I can go ahead and start since I was yeah. the first in this group to you do got that. It. Um, <laughs> you got it. You know, uh, ever since I was a graduate student, I was a joiner. Well, probably started in high school. And uh, I was uh, in the very first cohort of the Minority Fellowship Program. And Dallas Taylor and James Jones really encouraged the fellows to get involved in APA. And so I always did what I was told to do. So I went ahead and started joining. <laughs> Rosie, I saw that look on your face. <laughs> you don't believe that. And, and uh, I, I just sort of started joining boards and committees and task forces and so on. Uh, including early on in Division 17. I remember going to Alan Ivey's presidential talk in 1980. I got my doctorate in 78, 1980, and he talked about multiculturalism. And I thought, oh, this might be a home for me. And um, so anyway, I, was, uh, I served in, in various capacities, and people started encouraging me to run for April president. And it took 10 years of encouragement for me to finally say, okay. Uh, and I think the reason it took me 10 years is that there had never been a woman of color. There had only been 12 women presidents out of 120 when I ran for president. And so it, it wasn't conceivable to me, but you know what helped? Several things helped. 
One was three women of color had run for president. They had not gotten elected, but they had run. Diane Willis, um, Alice Chang, and Rosie Phillips Bingham had run. They didn't get elected, but I was so proud of them. I was so supportive of them, and I so respected their risk taking. I thought, well, if they did that, I can do it too. And if I don't get elected, I still see them in positive light. I will just go on like they did. And so they were inspiring to me to do that. And so in 2000, I think it was 2008, I took my mother with me to convention because I was getting a couple of awards. And I'm the first born of seven, so she liked to see us achieve. So I took her to convention. I think it was in San Francisco, but um, I, I, as, she, as she and I walked around all over the place, people kept encouraging me to run for AK president. She, she didn't know that until she saw that. And finally, toward the end of the, of the convention, she turned to me and she said, Mijita, why don't you run? And so I thought, okay, mom thinks I should run. So I decided to do it. <laughs> I decided to run. And then there's one other, both Rosie and, and Sandy were instrumental as well. Sandy said to me, how many boards and committees and divisions do you need to be president of before you're ready to run? So she sort of. That was a kinder version of what I said to you. <laughs> that's, like, that's, that's exactly right, because I was going to say, Sandy, please tell us what you said to Melba. <laughs> Uh, I said, and I'm quoting myself now, so I hope this is not offensive to others. I said, I am not going to wait until your ass is in every seat in every role of APA before you think you're ready to be the president of APA. <laughs> that is what you That's said. God's honest truth. That is, that is what you said. That is what you said. So it was a, it was a wild ride. It was, a, it was an amazing experience, and I'm grateful to have had it. Uh, so I guess I should go second. Uh, well, Melba, you know, I almost forgot that I ran for APA president back in whatever year that was, 2008 or six or whatever it was. Uh, because when I ran that time, it was certainly a spur of the moment decision. And I had um, been on the Council of Representatives and my road to the Council of Representatives is a different story. But I had been on, and, and, and while I was on council, I encountered this phenomenon of these people fighting about scientists and practitioners. And the scientists ought to have this, and the practitioners ought to have that. And I thought, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. How can psychologists be fighting about scientists and practitioners? So I decided that I was going to run for president of APA and tell everybody that we were all one as if they didn't know that, but I wanted. So I ran and every night I would pray, dear Lord, please don't let me be president of APA. But I really liked telling everybody. I, of course, I came to know the psychologists just liked to fight and they liked having a fight and nobody <laughs> cared about what I was saying. But nevertheless, I ran. I got to say that even though I didn't want to be president of APA, I still didn't like losing. So there is that. Uh, so my running for president of APA, I don't know how far to go back, but um, I got involved in APA much later. I got my degree in 1977, but I didn't get involved in APA. And in fact, I was working at the University of Florida and we had interns and we really... <laughs> And we really were arrogant about how many people like to come and do the internships with us. And then it started to decrease. And that was because people now were needed to come from accredited programs and we were not accredited. So Ursula Delworth came and she said, uh, if you don't know Ursula Delworth, you really should know that history about Ursula too. So she came down as a consultant to us in the Counseling Center in Florida. And she asked how many of us were members of APA. And of course, no hands went up because we were way too arrogant to be members of APA. And she said, well, shame on you and the nerve of you. You want an accredited internship and you're not even members of APA. So we all signed up. So I went to my first APA conference in 1983. I was actually pregnant with my son. Uh, and I found it the most cold. I, it was a horrible experience. Um, 
and I wandered around the conference, not finding anybody to talk. That was a time we were very, very critical. The way that you presented, you presented, and then everybody proceeded to tear you down. So that was the nature of how we presented at APA back in those days. And so even in 17, I didn't find a home. It was not a welcoming place back then. I found my home in Division 5 and Division 35, the section on Black women. And that was where I began to find a place. And then later on, Naomi Muir was president of Division 17, and Rosemary Phelps and I were complaining about not feeling welcome. And so she made Rosemary chair of the Committee on Ethnic Minority Affairs and, and put me on the committee. And then somebody said, and now you be chair. And so that's part of the way it happens is that people start to ask you to do things. And then uh, later on, I ran for president of um, Division 17 in Melbourne, much in the same way that you decided about running for president of APA. I ran for president of 17 because we'd not ever had a person of color. And I was not running to win. I was running to break that mold of, of people of color couldn't be president of 17. And so I barely campaigned. In fact, the, uh, it was, I think it was Cindy Justin and whoever was editor of the newsletter wrote to me and said, Rosa, please, everybody else is writing these kind of letters and you wrote this little paragraph. I said, well, okay then. So I wrote something else. Well, then when I won, I was so stunned. I didn't tell anybody for a week. I mean, I just had no plan. I was just running. And that got me to the Council of Representatives later on because in 17, 17, decided to vote to designate a seat for a person of color. And that was led really and truly in part by Linda Forrest. She was such a stickler and such an ally back in those days. And so she did that, so, so we did. But in my, all, what this has to do with being president of uh, APA and, and, and Brandy, you said keep it real. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this. So part of, I had uh, some difficulties with one of our uh, um, one of my colleagues, and uh, that colleague later asked me to run for president of APA. And my heart, the ice that I was carrying in my heart melted toward that individual. And so since she asked me to run last time around, she said, can I nominate you? And I said, okay, you can nominate me. It was the last week of nomination. Then all of these listeners saying, let's nominate Rosie, let's nominate Rosie. So I asked my husband, I said, ah, John, all these people saying, let's nominate Rosie. How would you feel about me running for president of APA? He literally fell backwards two or three steps because I had just stepped down from being vice president and he had just told my friend he finally had his wife back. So we made an agreement that if I got 100 nominations that I would run. And so when Susan McDaniel called me, and said, Rosa, you've been nominated. I said, well, yeah, I know. Uh, but my husband and I agreed, I'd only run if I got 100 nominations. She said, well, you got 119. And so my feet <laughs> literally fell off the chair, was propped up on, arrogantly thinking I had my no ready. <laughs> and so she said, I said, well, okay, then I guess I'm running. She said, you can run hard or you can run soft. I decided to run hard and run to win. And I had a great big old team that helped me run to win. Okay, well, there's both advantages and disadvantages of following these two for the entire of my, entirety of my career. So uh, <laughs> I hope I have something to say that's it, it, at least as important as the things they've said. I started the opposite way in 2012 to 2013 when I was doing the Good Governance Project. I had some people that started to encourage me to run for APA president, and I made the conscious decision not to run for APA president. Uh, given my professional career, and I work in organizational settings, I work with leaders, I was traveling a lot, I just really didn't feel like I was a good fit for the role at that point in terms of what it would take and all of that, and just, just didn't feel like maybe what I saw as the presidency of APA didn't intrigue me at that point. And I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't have, other than I wanted APA to get better, I wanted psychology to move forward. I, I had been both um, encouraged and exasperated by the good governance process. Um, and uh, I, I thought, no, I don't really need to be doing this the rest of my life. So I made that conscious decision and stayed there. 
And then coming along in around 2018 or whatever, as we had a change in, C in our CEO and a change in our focus and a new strategic plan, um, and uh, seeing Rosie run again and understanding the kind of things that Rosie um, uh, wanted to see happen, I thought, you know, this might be a time for me to help with a transition or a transformation of APA to focus on things that are important. And so some of my considerations were, I, I always, when I have any leadership role at all, I like to look at who I'm following and who's going to follow me. So in this particular case, having Rosie, to follow Rosie, both to support her and to, and to be mentored by her, I thought was a terrific option. Um, and I sought out advice from Melba and Linda and some a, a number of other folks. And then my partner, uh, uh, my partner in life, Peg, um, uh, I said, I need to revisit a decision. She was very happy with my initial decision, by the way, since I traveled all the time. She never saw me anyway. Why would she want me to be president of APA so I could travel all the time? Then I'd never be home. So she said to me, okay, I'll hear you out you make the case and I'll decide whether I'll weigh in on this. And so I, um, I, I, t I started telling her about, I think this is my time. If I'm going to ever do anything to contribute, uh, there's a vision for psychology. We'd really like to transform some places we're going in APA. And she said at the end of that, she looked me in the eye and she said, Sandy, I will agree under two conditions. Uh, one, that that's your purpose. You finally have a purpose and I agree with that purpose and I think you're qualified to do that. And number two, what she said to me, which was so important was, you have to promise me you won't do, and I'm gonna quote again, a half-ass job of running. You've <laughs> got to run like you mean to run. And it was the same issue that Rosie had. Are you gonna run hard or are you gonna run soft? Run to win or don't bother to do it at all. We don't really need you to do that. So that, that was the, um, so that those were the uh, kind of the compelling reasons at that point. I felt there was a time, there was a window of opportunity where we needed a different direction, a different focus, uh, a, a, a type of leadership at APA that was broader than just a constituency that really focused on the breadth and depth of psychology writ very large. And that's, that's, how I made, that's how I made the decision. And then I would just have to add after that, of course, the other part of that is Rosie had a fine team and... I could talk more about that later, but Rosie, of course, then helped me. Her team also became part of my team. And so there's been some tagging along the way uh, from, from, from uh, all of us to each other, which I cannot tell you how important that's been in our lives. Uh, it just you, occurred to me. Okay. Well, let me just say one thing. It just occurred to me, Sandy, too, that all three of us were affiliated with the Good Co Governance Project, and Linda was, too. Isn't that yes, amazing? exactly right. <laughs> That's that exactly was all, that was a collusion on your parts, but it was all. Well, it was a collusion. It was a, <laughs> it was a positively intended collusion, and and uh, we took it as far as we could. Uh, the uh, independent review and all the stuff that happened in there kind of derailed that whole process, yep. and then we got back on a track. Without, I mean, we still have those issues, but we got back on a track where there was an opportunity again to change the course of APA and psychology, and yep. that's really what we're interested in. Thank you, Rosie. So, so that's our stories, Brandy. We're sticking to them. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. A plus for keeping it real. You know, I, one of the things I can't help but notice, though, is y'all were working really hard to not run. <laughs> you know, nope, nope, don't want it. So it just seems like there was so much support and encouragement from the people around you that saw something that we all clearly very much needed. I'm so gracious to you. It's a risk. Follow up. What would you all say is each other's greatest victory or challenge? Greatest victory. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll go first um, because I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I do know this, and that is that I think we all. You know, I, I, I may be the most spiritual one and I believe in callings and I believe that we'll call to do the job at the right time. And so I'm so grateful that Sandy is president right now because she's the president that we need at a time like this. Her, her strength, her leadership, her organizational skills 
really and truly. I mean, I had to run all over the world and do all that kind of stuff. We don't need anybody doing that now. We do need somebody helping us through such a challenging time and knows how to help an organization work. And that's what, uh, that's what Sandy does. Now, now for, for Melba, uh, Melba told me, when I, or, or not me personally, but someone her greatest joy was um, being president of APA. So she's a great role model. But what Melba has this ability to do is to make you believe that you can do it. For me, uh, working on the summit with her still stands as, and, and Daryl Sue and Lisa Portia Burke, still stands as one of the greatest moments of my life. But is that way of acceptance. Melba is a great ally and is so accepting until one time we were in Washington State, I believe, and I was talking to a group of black women. So I thought, and I was talking about how we were all black and sisters and whatnot. And there, was, there was nobody who was not black in the crowd. And Melba said, well, me. I said, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but she's just a sister and she knows how to be a loving, smart, and she can reprimand you in a very loving way. <laughs> a velvet glove. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I have to say that um, these are, uh, I, I just feel so lucky today. Um, for, first, I forgot to say, Brandy, that I really like the way you started with uh, honoring um, uh, and acknowledging the horrific murders um, of uh, George Floyd and others. It's part of what I love about our division, how our division has evolved and how our division has influenced APA's direction to social justice. We can talk more about that later. Uh, but one, one of the things that I, I love about, um, I don't know Brandy as well, but I, you know, with Rosie and, and Sandy and Linda is that I feel like they have my back. I have their back. And, and uh, I trust them incredibly, and um, I think I think Brandy's moving into that category as is well, and Julia is too. And actually, all this everybody up here is wonderful. But um, both both Rosie and and Sandy are amazingly strong and firm. They can take on anything and anybody, um, and yet they are the kindest, gentlest people at the right time as well. I just love that combination in leaders. And, um, you know, uh, they both have it. And I just really appreciate that about each of them very much. Thank you. And they're both very productive, uh, by the way. They get a lot done. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I always chuckle and say that I've always been excited to be associated with Melba and Rosie in the land of the one named presidents. You don't need to know their last names, right? It's Melba and it's Rosie, right? Now, Sandy could be 6,000 other people, but Rosie and Melba are. And the reason that's true, though, and this is where I think some of their greatest strengths are as leaders, is not only are they representatives of people who historically have been marginalized in psychology and our culture in general, but they are embodiments of the values that we're trying to integrate, particularly in counseling psychology and in psychology in general. So the, the, their, their first names to me embody a whole set of values-based kinds of things, the kind of values that create a multicultural summit. Uh, the kind of values which out of the multicultural summits, I remember the difficult conversations and the conflict that happened. And some of, some of the highlights for me is working with the two of you in some very difficult conversations around race, around uh, sexual orientation, et cetera, and how, how we could all live together as marginalized groups with lack of, with, who lacked understanding of, of our differences with each other. And so uh, to me, those, those were some of the most um, amazing pieces. I, I think, uh, Melba, one of the things that I have come to appreciate about you as a leader, and I saw this in so many situations, there, there's, there's a white people's version of this, which is called Steel Magnolias for Women. I don't know what the Latina version of this would be. Uh, matcha, maybe it's matcha. I don't really know, but... Um, um, Melba has the most incredible ability to be present, be persistently 
pleasant, gracious, and a good listener and have a backbone that is as strong as you can possibly imagine. And so she, she bends, but she never breaks and she brings people with her. And Rosie's abilities that I see, and I've seen it time and time again, is inspiring people uh, and uh, calling people to the vocation of the calling that you have, Rosie, the spiritual calling. You engage people to come into that. That's always been your style of leadership. And people respond to that from both of you. And that's, I think that's one of your real strengths. So you are both culture changers from, from uh, a wide variety of perspectives. And that's um, something that I just have really admired in this, the strength. So the poverty initiatives, the multicultural summit, the work on immigration, those are all naturally flowing from the embodiment of who you are as people. Wow. That, I loved hearing all of your takes on the other strengths, and I agree wholeheartedly with everything that has been said about each of you. Um, I feel like I could just say ditto to each of your comments about each other. Uh, and how, how wonderful to hear you share that in front of all of our counseling psychology colleagues. And meanwhile, in the chat box, while you guys have been talking about your strengths, one of the questions that got asked was, anybody out there thinking about running for APA president? And we have a crew of people who have said yes. Oh, um, and we have a bunch of people that are recruiting Annalise right now. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you're inspiring a lot of people, and that's really, really wonderful, and that's part of what we wanted to accomplish from today's conversation together. Um, so I'm going to hit you with another question, um, and I think it's a really important question that fits with the, uh, the polling that just went on, which is, um, can you talk for a moment about how your training and your identity as a counseling psychologist and how your experiences as a counseling psychologist influenced and informs your leadership and informed your APA presidency? Well, I can, I can start, you know, I, I talked about seeing Al Ivey's um, presidential talk on multiculturalism. And by the way, it was not well received. People in the audience were uh, rude. They were not receptive, but I was very inspired. I was very inspired and I liked it. And um, I think it was about that time, I don't know if it was under his presidency or soon thereafter or right before that Manny Casas and I were asked to chair the first um, minority committee or task force of the division. And so that sort of got me in there and, uh, but, but I did soon uh, experience the coldness, Rosie, that you're describing that in the rest of the division, it was not warm at that point uh, or, or, or that welcoming uh, consistently across. Uh, so I also got involved in 35 and then I helped found 45. Those are my three primary divisions. But um, one of the things that was true was that Carolyn Payton was a member of Division 17. And uh, she was uh, an active, you know, I knew her through her work with ethics and I knew her through her work with um, accreditation and, um, and 17, you know, she was an active member and, and she came in and out sort of. And um, also Leona Tyler, I had the very first board I was on was the Board of Social and Ethical Responsibility Psychology, which emer evolved into the Appy combined with BEMA, Board of Ethnic Minority Affairs. And Leona Tyler was on the board. My very first board in 1980 was with Leona Tyler. We had dinners together. We overlapped for only one year, unfortunately, but we overlapped. I did, I did not know how lucky I was at the time, but um, she was a big influence. She really did. Um, you know, one of the things about mentoring is that, um, I, I never really had any one mentor. I feel like I had several mentoring moments and experiences with a wide variety of people, people who've influenced me. And so she was one. She talked about Division 17. And there are other people like Naomi Mira and Ursula Delworth uh, who, who were there, uh, who, who were in 17, who did have a positive influence. And then the values of the association 
the focus on humanity, you know, the focus on development and positive aspects of development and um, the focus on looking at the environment, including all the variables that go into identity development. I think those all contributed to the, the evolution of social justice as a, a prime value in our division as well as in APA. So, um, and, and I, I, did, I did run for, after Rosie became president in 99, I became president of the, of the division in 2002. I had to look up to see when that was, I wasn't sure. We were president at the, at the same time in 99, because I was president of Division 35, which was uh, uh, Psychology of Women. And um, that's when we established the National Multicultural Conference and Summit with Gerald Winkson in 45. But those, those were all values that we were pushing and floating around and, you know, messing with. <laughs> I'm going to let you go, Sandy, because I'm still thinking about it. All right. Well, you just let me know when you're ready, Rosie. That's it. That's good. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I would say um, that more than anything, probably, counseling psychology gave me a space in which I could develop in a fairly non-traditional way as a psychologist. Uh, I recognized very early being in a more traditional counseling psych program, uh, actually Rosie and I came out of the same counseling psych program, that I didn't fit very well. And part of the reason that I didn't fit um, was um, that I looked at systems and structures. And uh, for me, quite honestly, I thought individual therapy for me was, if, and, because I had a background as a math, math, mathematician, and to me, it seemed just a numbers game. It was an in, in, uh, individual therapy seemed like a very inefficient way to help a variety of the world with a lot of issues. And I also uh, was attracted to the values of counseling psychology, particularly the notion that, that psychology was for people who were at a whole spectrum of health. And to me, that was really important. And that systems, person environment systems, affected the ability for people to bring that health out in themselves. And so I, I really thought that the world of work, uh, that the world of education, that the world of health, that where the context that people were in was really important. And along with what Melba said about development was important. If you ask me today what my identity is as a psychologist, yeah, I would say as a counseling psychologist, but more importantly, what I would probably tell you is that I'm an applied developmental psychologist and with a specialty in working with executives, leaders, and organizations. But the values and the space to open up came from counseling psychology. My earliest experience in, in Division 17 was I was one of the first two graduate representatives to what turned into the Committee on Women, uh, the, or the, the section on women. And um, at that time, it was a big deal. Graduate students weren't really represented anywhere. Yeah, so the fact that we were asked to be a part of that was because the women's group uh, believed from a feminist perspective in inclusion. And so uh, myself and the other, by the way, the other representative was Louise Fitzgerald. And so we came in, we were um, uh, uh, colleagues and we came in and so we were working very hard on women's issues. And there was a place then, so counseling psychology gave a place uh, for where I could kind of develop my own version of life. Um, and so if you look at the definition that's uh, in the, the accreditation thing for counseling psychology, and it talks about organizational counseling psychology, at least counseling psychology gave me a place to create that. It really wasn't there. Um, and I remember when I gave my fellows talk, um, and actually Melba and I gave our fellows talks at the same time. And I, I um, gave a talk basically on looking at psychology differently. And it was about living psychology at what I call the O5 level. I kept that theme in my whole career. And at the end of that, a very famous, I will not tell you who it is, a very famous white male counseling psychologist came up to me and he said, that's either the most brilliant thing I've ever heard, or it makes no sense at all. And he walked away, all right? So there was both a place and not a place in counseling psychology for me. 
So, so it's an interesting question of, it says, how does counseling psychology influence your presidency? Was that it? Sort of the training and values and identity as a counseling psychologist. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that influence your leadership and your APA presidency? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's hard for me to separate it out <clears throat> as counseling psychology. Um, I tell people, my, 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 you know, my life is kind of happenstance. I, I um, you know, I've told some of you, I never even applied to the Ohio State Counseling Psychology Program, but I got accepted. I'm one of, as somebody else has told me a story of being accepted and not applying um, because a, a professor there, David Shaw, thought I would be a great counseling, or at least good, anyway, counseling psychologist. And he said, why don't you apply and you come and talk to me and I'll tell you what to say so you get in, have your folder sent over from the College of Education. I did have my folder sent over, but I never went to talk to him and I never applied. But I got accepted contingent upon finishing my master's, which I did. And then quite frankly, I went to, to graduate school. I, I decided it was December when I finished my master's and I wasn't ready to go to work. I may as well stay in school. And so I stayed in school and, I, and, and then about in 75, I said, oh, I finished all my courses. It's time to do my dissertation. I guess I'm going to get a doctorate. <clears throat> so I don't know that I was married to any values in counseling psychology. And in fact, counseling psychology evolved. It came to have a social justice uh, um, direction. Mm -hmm. It was not there in the beginning. I think we all evolved it into that. Right. And so, but, but, but the thing about being a psychologist. I wrote a piece for the 17 newsletter one time about am I still a psychologist? And it is that training, that, that scientist practitioner training that counseling psychology imbued in us that I think has influenced me and in how I think about things because I really like data and I like data applied to something that makes a difference. So I used it as a vice president to get things done, I would turn to, what does the data tell us about something? I even had my staff, they all had to give me data if they wanted funding for something. So I think it's that scientist practitioner model that helped me a lot. And over time, what counseling psychology has come to me, I think is embodied in that. And so even the thinking about something like deep poverty is what does the science tell us? How can we use it to make a difference, to change something, to make a difference in the world? And that is what I, I truly believe. I would say that being in the program, though, influenced me and helped me to change my values and my thinking. I think being in, in our counseling psychology program is the first thing that moved me away from being homophobic, for example. I learned more about accepting people for people. Now, I thought I did the thing on race and stuff, but not the sexuality thing. I didn't, that did not happen. And it was, uh, and I can remember clearly, who was it, Sandy, that we were on a retreat with? Um, is it Ann? Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know who you mean. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think it was it, it, those experiences not so much the values, but the experiences, the, the living with the people in the program, I think helped to shape me, not, not the values of the program, because we struggled a lot, even back in those days with, uh, <clears throat> when I got into the program, at first nobody wanted to be my, even though I, I was accepted, nobody wanted to be my advisor. And then when I got an advisor, I had a black woman who was my advisor, and she felt so stressed and put upon that she wanted to make sure and she told us, there was another black woman in me in the program, she told us she didn't want it to appear that she was showing us favoritism. And that was because of the pressure that she felt. When she left, then Bruce Walsh became my advisor. And he was a very good advisor for me because he asked me to do things. And, and Melba, I always liked to say yes too. So I would say, okay. <laughs> but it was good for me to say yes to a lot of things. So I don't know, I, I, I hope that was helpful. <clears throat>
So it's interesting, one of the comments in the uh, chat box has been that 17% of the people on the line right now don't have a mentor, don't feel like they have mentoring happening in their lives right now. Um, so the good news is 83% feel like they do, but 17% are not. And I just would like a quick response from all of you about not having a mentor, because my guess is all of you came of age in a time in which you might have been short of mentors too, though maybe not, because I'm thinking also of some of the mentors I know each of you had. But um, the whole issue of um, networking and connecting and creating support around you with your peers or the slightly ahead of you peers, that's been a big, huge part, I think, of all of your uh, development as psychologists. And it would just be good for you to speak to it for a moment for those 17% of the people who don't have mentors. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll go first with that because I, I liked, I, I, I had a lot of people who supported me in various ways. And my fellow talk was the nurturance of my sisters. So my friends and whatnot who supported me. But I had people, I mean, when I was in graduate school, my first uh, advisor who was in my um, counselor education program wouldn't let me take an I. <laughs> you, couldn't, you can't have an incomplete, no, uh-uh, you can't have that. And then, even though I went through that odd time in counseling psych, when Bruce Walsh became my advisor, I mean, he really stuck with me when I got ready to do my research and I gave him this really elaborate thing I wanted to do. He said, well, yeah, you could do that or you could do this part of my research. And I said, okay. And then he said, when we finished that, okay, Rosie, now it's time to publish an article. Then he says, Rosie, will you write a chapter in this book? And then eventually he says, Rosie, I think it's time for you to be a fellow. I didn't even know what a fellow was. I told you what Naomi Mira did. I had, uh, I did a, a six month uh, um, group with uh, Sandy Shulman when we were in graduate school. I believe to this day that the reason I got on the ethics committee was Melba Vasquez did something, I didn't even know who she was. <laughs> and, and, and I use, uh, and when I was on the board of 17, I was our first vice president for diversity because I came on as a member at large and we changed. That board was not a fun place to be. And when we had those discussions about uh, race and ethnicity and, and talked about making sure we had a person of color represented and tried to create that seat uh, for one of the council representatives. Let me tell you, it was um, uh, Linda Forrest and Linda, other Linda from- uh, Linda Brooks. Linda Brooks, who fought that fight, and, and I didn't have to fight that. They were willing to carry the water and deliberately saying, you don't have to fight this, we'll do it. So, so I think it's finding people where you can find them. And if somebody out there doesn't have a mentor and want to write to me, write to me. Oh, all right. That's a big offer right there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a big believer in peer mentoring. People, you know, um, help each other. You know, um, we have a lot of information that most are willing to share. Um, um, hopefully, most of us don't live in very competitive environments where people won't share information. But a lot, I've gotten a lot of peer mentoring, and um, as as I said earlier, that sort of situational mentoring where you get a piece that here and a piece there. I remember. Um, uh, a few of us asking Martha Bernal, the first Latina psychologist ever in this world, uh, if she would share a, a panel for us at convention. And it was early on, I think some, some of us had never presented, some of us had done one or two presentations. And she said, okay, but you're gonna, you're gonna show up in my hotel room at this day, at this time, and we're gonna go through all your presentations. And we did, and she edited and she gave feedback and she did. I can't imagine the time she took to do that. And I remember um, Amado Padilla hearing him give a talk and I found out he was the editor of a couple of journals and I said, if I send you my manuscript, would you mind reading it? And he kind of paused like, who's this little ad here asking for something like that? But he said, okay, go ahead and do it. And he did, he, he edited two or three of my manuscripts early on. Uh, so, you know, asking people to do things and. Some will say yes, some will say no. Uh, Rosie just offered, you know, to help 200 people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, all of them don't need help. <laughs> um, and, and um, you know, uh, and, and just um, 
just sort of modeling after people. I, I have um, been aware that I have observed people and without even talking to them, decided that they have qualities and elements that I want to uh, try to uh, emulate and, and cultivate in myself, you know. Um, and so that's not mentoring, but that's sort of um, allowing people to influence us as role models. So anyway. You no, know, I would add to that. I, I did not feel I had, uh, well, I made the tragic mistake in 1970. This is, things are different now, but I made the tragic mistake in 1970. First of all, 1970, if you remember, was when there were all the anti-war disruptions for Vietnam. Um, uh, I, I was at Harvard uh, in a master's program, and I, I did have a mentor there, uh, David Tiedemann, who was a mathematician and vocational psychologist. And he was creating avant-garde video experiences and systems. Um, he was about 30 years ahead of his time about that. And we had a great relationship. But then um, the, the upshot of the whole thing was I wanted to go on for a PhD in counseling psych. And he really encouraged me to do that. And at that time, Ohio State was one of the better programs in the country. and I, I, like Rosie, never applied formally because by the time I went to apply, the campus was closed. Um, I, I, seem to, I seem to attract these times when all the institutions close down when I come near. I don't know why that is. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, so I, I, didn't, I didn't have at Ohio State the mentoring and the counseling psych program, but I had a woman in developmental psych who took me on. And it turns out her background was in mathematics as well. And that may be why we hit it off. I had an advisor and um, he, he was a good advisor, but not anybody, he, our interests, we were just different people. And um, uh, what happened finally, uh, I, I, this is the story, this is my version of the story, but this very young, very um, uh, talented uh, prod prodigy was recruited from Minnesota to be on the faculty at Ohio State. Her name was Nancy Betts. She was about 12 years old, as I recall the story. Um, <laughs> and here's what I think happened. I, at that point in time, I had dropped out of Ohio State at that point. I was assistant dean of students at Ohio State. I had a great administrative career. I was a very young administrator that was doing all sorts of innovative programming at Ohio State. All the off-campus programs at Ohio State started all of those in the, in the 1970s. Um, and here's the story that I think happened. Um, I think they went to her and they said, we have, well, they came to me first, I'm sure, and said, we have a young faculty member here as a prodigy, but we've got to break her in to get her graduate faculty status. So will you work with her? Because I actually was older than she was at that point. And I said, sure, I can. Still are. Yes, still are. <laughs> it works that way. That, and then I think they went to her and, and, and they said, we have this, what I referred to as a student emeritus, who was, needs to finish up and get out of here. Can you work with her and get her moving? And that literally was the beginning of a long relationship, mentoring and friendship, lifelong uh, friendship. Uh, and actually, one of my biggest disappointments this year in not having an in-person convention is that Nancy's getting an APA award, and I, as president, would have the opportunity to give it to her in person. I still might give it to her in person. She lives about a mile from where I live. but That's a good uh, idea. Yeah. I, yeah. I, we might do it in person, but I, I, I miss the opportunity to share that experience with everybody else. But I didn't really have, until that point, I went for, I drifted. I absolutely drifted. And so I would agree with Melba about, and, and, and Rosie and your versions of the peers in your life after a while became really mentors. We mentored each other through a lot of things because our needs were also very different than most of the senior mentors, quite honestly, because so many things had changed. We were interested in social justice issues. Um, and that wasn't really a part of what a lot of that particular generation was uh, yeah. Of, of uh, advisors was really involved in. But just to wrap this section up, there's been a pretty powerful shout out to peer mentoring on, in the chat box um, and all the people who have experienced spectacular peer mentoring. Um, and so 
you, you know, it's clear from all three of your answers, peer mentoring is super important and it's super important to all the people that are on the, um, the webinar with us. And Brandy, I'm going to turn it back over to you for the next question. I am so encouraged by this conversation, though, and you all are making me think of, if anybody saw the film, I've referenced this before, the film, the movie Selma, anybody saw that? But, and there's so much significance, obviously, to the film, but there was one particular scene that was seemingly insignificant where the, the, the actor playing Martin Luther King called up Mahalia Jackson, if anybody knows who that is, an artist, a singer, and just talk to her on the phone. Like just, that's like just calling Beyonce. Like just talk to her on the phone and got some support and encouragement from her. And it just made me think of how such influential people supporting other such influential people before they know just how influential they are. And, and, and I love what you said, Melba, earlier about being open to receive that like almost passive mentorship without a formality. And you all are encouraging that significantly tonight when you read the comments in the Zoom. So thank you on behalf of all of our participants. Brandy, that, Brand, Brandy can I just uh, uh, say uh, one thing more? That, that is, I, I wanna give a shout out to my friend, Barbara Henley, because she's a peer and she went in jobs before me a lot. Yeah. And, and, and so I wanted to, do that. but here's another one where you take your encouragement wherever you can. I remember one time being so down in the dumps and thinking I wouldn't finish my PhD. And I went to hear Maya Angelou speak. And afterwards, you know how they let you talk to them sometimes. So I was in line. So I'm in line and all of a sudden I'm talking to this lady and I'm near her. And I'm working on my doctorate. I'm stuck. And I hear it. And she wrote, she autographed my book and she said, go on PhD like I already had it. <laughs> And then I just went back and was perked up, I tell you. So you never know where it's going to come from. And Ann Wilson Schaaf was that woman's name, by the way. It was Ann Wilson Schaaf. Memory lane gets a little shorter as you get older. You just have to be careful <laughs> about that. Um, uh, Rosie, when you saw Maya Angelou, was that at Ohio State? It was. All right, because I want to add to that as a you moment. <laughs> no, my partner, Peg, was uh, uh, in charge of women's, uh, was, did women's programs at Ohio State at that point in the student affairs office. And she brought in Maya Angelou. Yeah. And because yeah. of that, she and I got to spend that day that you had that day with her. We got the day with Maya Angelou, Ooh. taking her around and working with her. And if you wanted to be in the presence of somebody that you, I mean, you could just absorb, I mean, this was at her most, vibrant yeah. self yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, absolutely um it was spellbinding so uh -huh. i think both of us were impacted in maybe different ways but very profound ways by that same day so tail pig thanks for my phd I, I <laughs> that's right <laughs> my proxy it. she influenced that right that's um, good that's she got a role in that so if, if i may we're going to ask even more of you than what we've already asked for um and, and that is this, building on our history collectively, right? What do you find to be, what is required of the current and next generation of counseling psychologists as we shape the next 75 years? And I know y'all have the answer. Well, we do. What advice do you have for us? I'll take the lead on this one, um, if, if that's okay with you all. Um, First of all, um, I think it's important to go back to the roots of counseling psychology, the roots, and, and then reformat them for the 21st century. The roots of counseling psychology were in the communities, dealing with people that had lost resources in the depression, had, had, had the vocational groups, working with people where they were, and they weren't necessarily involved with diagnoses or any of those kind of issues. The roots of counseling psychology are where I think the current counseling psychologists need to take us. Only we need to go into different communities with a different mindset, which is a mindset of marginalized communities by race, ethnicity, et cetera. The, 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 the communities right now that are being so hard hit by all of our uh, social justice issues and go back to the notion that, that psychology is for everybody and some people need individual work, some people need 
uh, deep dives into men mental health issues, but some people need uh, psychoeducation, positive psychology, preventative issues, um, and, 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 and that we do this on multiple levels, individual, group, community kinds of things. And we go with this mindset that people are inherently healthy or could be healthier, that they bring the health and that the context and the environment they interact with is, is a major part. The systems are a major part of the problems that have been created. And so the structural and systemic pieces are where I hope counseling psychology will go next with the social justice lens put on them. And that's my vision for psychology. That's my vision that we move to population health models, that we move to structural and systemic issues, and that we focus on those big social justice issues. As you can tell, they're happening right now as we speak in the streets of Minneapolis. There's so much for us to do, but we've got to get out of the mindset of one, trying to be in the medical model only and trying to just do individual work only. I think that's, those are, those are my hopes for our, our generations of counseling psychologists. I, I totally, I totally agree. I really want psychology in general, including our division to be a force to promote a more humane society. Uh, because there's a big portion of our society that has gotten away from that. And um, we do need to have multiple strategies, as Sandy was saying, to impact not just individuals and communities, but systems, organizations and systems, and, and to understand how policies have all kinds of impact, you know, uh, broad impact that sometimes... Congress is so fast, or, you know, from, from at, the, at the city level to the government level uh, or the national government level, we, we don't realize how policies, laws, and administrative decisions and so on in universities everywhere have such impact. And we have to pay more attention to all those. And when we mess up to quickly correct those, it, I could go on and on about that. But, but I, think, I think counseling psychology um, has... Uh, some of the models and certainly some of the expertise to help promote um, that, if we could figure out how to do that. that. That's what I'd like to see us being involved with in the next 75 years. And if I could add a global perspective to that, Melba, the mm -hmm. irony for me this year as APA president, Rosie, is I probably have spent more time with my international counterparts than you had the opportunity to do yeah. because we now meet twice a week with 50 to 60 different psychological association leaders around the world. And we are actually addressing some of these structural and systemic issues with, with different cultural lenses to see where the common, common strategies are and how we can support each other in going forward. So if I can add to that lens as well, I would say, and, and take that as far as you can nationally and globally. I wanna underscore that that's one of your major contributions this year, Sandy. Thank you. It really is. Thank you. So what? So what I'll add to that, I'm I'm always uh, going to say and uh, rely on science, but make science broader. So w one of my uh, graduate, one of my advisees is writing <clears throat> a dissertation, and it's it's about um, the erasure of Black women's voices, and the way she's constructing. In first place, she's brilliant. I have to have my dictionary with me when I read her proposal, and she's proposing tomorrow. But she is uh, going from an intersectional and a dark and feminist uh, approach with what she's doing. is nothing like I ever would have been trained on. And she's trying to bring those voices into, in, into the discussion. And it's going to change the way that we think about things. So the science, but a much broader science than that science that many of us were trained on. She's going to going to do that. And so what, what I would say is uh, something that is taking me a long time. And Brandy, you started off talking about being enraged. And that's what when I learned, I learned uh, Linda Forrest, <clears throat> when I was having back pain and whatnot, uh, told me to read this book called Heal in the Back. And <laughs> Sarno talks about how he stopped doing surgeries and giving uh, people medicine because he found that driven people. <laughs> and I decided anybody who with run for president of APA has to be driven. Uh, <laughs> that there are three things, a sense of inferiority, a sense of anxiety and anger. And I didn't think about myself as being angry about anything. And I started trying to say, what am I angry about? 
And then one day when, when we were in our neighborhood and I lived, lived in this cloistered, gated community, I'm walking, and, then, and this white woman was out walking her dogs. And it was dusk, dark. And I realized, I started taking care of her because John and I were together and I wanted to reassure her that she didn't need to be scared. She didn't need to be scared of us. And when I realized it and I started realizing I'm walking around in my own damn neighborhood trying to protect everybody from being scared of me. And so I got enraged. I discovered I wasn't angry, I was enraged. And so what I've come to know, and this is what my advice to you all is, I want you to be radically yourself, radically yourself. Care about others, but be radically yourself and bring it on to us because we need you. I'd like well, to I'm just going to say that Rosie gave me permission. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say, Rosie said, I'm just following direction. That's what I, that works for me. I think it works for me. I'd like to add one other piece to this that I think counseling psychology can bring to psychology writ large is a real, uh, a deeper dive into uh, a, an understanding at all levels about intersectionality. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that has happened when we've dealt with social justice and inclusion and diversity, we've taken it, it's kind of like this group versus this group versus this group versus this group. And uh, in, in March, when I was writing one of my um, monitor columns, um, which is one of the joys and challenges you have as an APA president. And right before COVID happened, I needed a monitor. I was coming with an upcoming monitor column, but then COVID happened and I had to redirect a lot of what I was saying. But I, I want to read you something. I was so infuriated one day about the, the narrowness of perspectives in psychology to solve problems. And this is what I think the opposite of this is what I hope that you will bring. And I said, Using myself as an example, at various times in my APA career, I have been literally told the following. I am not feminist enough. I am not lesbian enough. I am either not white enough or I'm too white. I'm not Jewish enough. I'm not practice enough. I'm not applied enough. I'm not science enough. I'm not, put your own theoretical orientation in there, enough. I'm not progressive enough. I'm not conservative enough. I'm not clinical enough. I'm not consulting enough. I'm not research enough. Oh, yes. I'm, not, I'm not disability enough. I'm not military enough. I'm not human rights enough. I'm not social justice enough. And so my point is uh, understanding the, the intersection of identities means bringing multiple perspectives to a situation. And I find even in our, even in our equity and diversity and inclusion pieces, we bring siloed identities at times. And to me, that's whether it's a view of psychology or your personal identity as a human being, that's where I think we get into trouble. And I think counseling psychology could lead the way uh, in opening that up for psychology. Thank you so much for that, Sandy. It, it really segues beautifully to some of the questions of our uh, viewers tonight, if we're gonna stick with the television theme. And I wanna read it verbatim to capture the essence of what this anonymous attendee wrote, because it fits with exactly what you just said as we start to get into some of your questions. This is so encouraging to hear. I have an interest in background and leadership and also tend to think about systems and organizations, but I get stuck feeling as though I don't fit in with my peers, especially with other women, sadly. I'm curious if the panelists have ever struggled with this, perhaps feeling that the road to their presidency was lonely at times and fought with resistance, especially from other women. How did you overcome? Uh, let, let me just, just say- I'm in no <laughs> Not all at once, not all at once. What, what yeah. did you say, Linda? I just have to comment that I was in the room when Sandy was called a corporate feminist. <laughs> what the hell is that? Well, that's, that's what I said. So that, there you go. <laughs> go ahead and answer the question I just said. It is all lonely. I don't ever, I don't think I ever felt like I fit anywhere. And um, I just decided that was the way it was. And I had to make my space and find 
uh, one or two allies. As long as I felt like there were one or two allies in the room, it was okay. And um, then, then it would get a little better. Sometimes it got a little worse. Um, but, um, you know, the people on this panel have been, have been some of those one or two people that made it feel uh, safe enough. Um, but it's all about risk taking. All of this is about risk taking. Uh, and, and we have to trust ourselves to rise to the occasion and to handle not only the content and knowledge and skills and so on, but the isms that we experience and the, the, the hurts uh, sometimes from our own um, people we expected to support us and didn't. Uh, so yeah, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult process, but you have to kind of trust yourself um, to, to, to handle it and have enough support in your life to handle it. Yeah. I, I, w I would say that sometimes even now I feel pretty alone because people think you're powerful and you're all that and you're too busy to be bothered with them so they don't bother you. So you get to be all alone. Um, but uh, I, I would say one of the things I have found about psychologists too is that I rarely find any psychologist who feels like they fit in. Everybody feels like an outsider. <laughs> and and it, it, I, I don't know any group of psychologists, maybe a very small group. I could name maybe 10 people who feel like they're it, but mostly they feel on the outside. I think when I did my fellows talk, I believe Roberta Nutt and, and Louise Dallas maybe were on, and I remember their talks were about being outsiders and so, and, and being on the margins. And so I don't think that that, and maybe there is something about psychologists since we'd like to be in our heads and deal, I, I don't know, maybe there is something, I don't know, but it's not unusual. The thing of it is, is to keep going anyway. And, and I'll say this too about uh, being president too, is that it's a, a wonderful thing uh, of being a leader anywhere where you're a leader that to not take any of it too seriously because the praise is not as much as they are and the criticism is not personal, but having everybody in the room, I always try to have a group of sisters around me to help me get through it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. And I, I've always been, a boundary spanner. I didn't, and I won't go into the long developmental history of why that was, but uh, I learned a long time ago that I was always on the edge of many groups. And the transition I made and the transition that I would recommend is if you look at the history of great positive disruptions and great discoveries, they always happen in the intersections. They don't happen in the middle. And, you know, Rosie's theme when she was Division 17 president of make the circle bigger, there's a reason for that. You want to bring that new thinking to the middle. So from my perspective, instead of trying to fit in, I have created spaces in the intersections for myself because I think truly that's where I, I and I think lots of other people and I think the culture thrives when we create some of those intersections. Was there another question? Yeah, I was going to say that. There Did are you... many, and I'm trying to. <laughs> there, was a question. there was a question earlier about how can you be prolific writers while you're so busy being, <laughs> um, you know, in your case, Melba, in private practice, um, Sandy, in your case, teaching around the world, uh, uh, Rosie, in your case, uh, being a vice president for many, many years and now a full-time faculty member, um, you know, how, how do you do the pro prolific writing that you've done? I used to do it on vacation. <laughs> it's sad to say, but I would, I would, I would schedule, I would schedule annual leave so that nobody could call me, uh, even though that didn't work as a vice president. But early on in some of those administrative jobs, I would, I would feel less guilty. And so I would, I would sit home and and then I would do stuff like put in a load of clothes, you know, how you wash a load of clothes. You dry. And by the time the, the, the cycle ended, it was time to stand up and take a break. I mean, <laughs> what, I don't know. Just, I, just say yes and figure out you get it done. I don't know. Maybe you all probably have a better answer. I no, no I, I have to find blocks of time. And for me, my energy is early morning. So I would cut back on sleep. And, and get up early to write two or three hours before going to work. And um, the other thing I discovered along the way is that if I have a co-author, I am much more likely to get it done because I owe it to people 
Um, and uh, so that has helped. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I would add to that. I think one of the uh, uh, blessings I've had in my life is that I've had good uh, colleagues from the academy who have kept me engaged in projects. And so, you know, so, uh, you know, it started with Nancy Betts and, and Ruth Fassinger and Louise Fitzgerald and a number of other people. And again, as colleagues, thinking outside of the box about things that were important, I, I was encouraged by them to, to not get too far afield and out of, out of, the, out of the circle. And that they would say things like, well, those are great ideas. Let's incorporate them. Let's get you involved in that. So I would give a lot of credit to a lot of my colleagues that I have, uh, I have had who have, have really encouraged me um, uh, to write. And then the, 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 uh, uh, Melvin and I were having this discussion the other day that I said, I'm never writing another article. I'm so sick of it. But even then, I got somebody who writes all the time. My, so my presidential uh, um, piece in AP uh, has a co-writer. And then the last chapter I plan to write, I'm thinking about getting a student to write it with me because I have written with some students sometimes. And, and I think it is that commitment, Melba, that if you get somebody to write it with you, then you feel a little more obligation to get it done. Yep. There are, thank you all, there are several questions that we haven't had the opportunity to get to. So I'm going to modify and see if we can squeeze them in because I always want more. So <laughs> we'll see if we can make this work. We're going to do a quick lightning round, okay, before we turn it over to our incredible leaders that started the night, Julia, Annalise, and Carmen. And in this lightning round, these are the rules. And I'm gonna try to integrate some of your questions into this. So y'all can't think too hard. You just gotta answer quick, okay? The first one, we start light and simple. You know, what is your preference for relaxation? Mountains or beach? See, Mountains. psychologists are so challenging. Y'all thinking too hard. Uh, probably beach. Beach. Oh, beach. Okay. I'll keep going. Movies, a book, or a jam session? Some music. Book. Easy. <laughs> movies. Movies. <laughs> okay. Biggest pet peeve. What just gets on your last nerve? Somebody saying, let APA do it, not realizing they're APA too. <laughs> I'm hearing a challenge there, Rosie. That's a bit of a challenge. I was going to be more generic and say, somebody should, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. As opposed to taking any reason. It really is the somebody should. I'm sorry. Mine is very mundane. A dirty house. <laughs> <laughs> Drives me nuts. <laughs> okay, this one gets a little more tricky. As APA president, what has been your greatest sacrifice? Uh, time away from family. Um, I was lucky that my spouse, uh, Jim Miller, was very, very helpful and involved and engaged. But I have six brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews, and I, I was really, really involved with them. And then I took time away and um, saw them much, much less for a period of about six years. Uh, so that was that was the, the biggest loss. Rosie, you got an answer to that one? I don't. Do you have one? Well, I'm sitting here thinking I'm only in the fifth month of my presidency. I don't know what I'm giving up yet completely. All right. So I, I probably can answer that better next year. But what I what I would say thus far would I, I'd second what Mel, Melba has said about certainly being president elect and prior to that time time with family and also time with my business colleagues uh, who have given a lot and uh, been very supportive of me and I've given up a lot of engagement with my organizational clients and things like that at a time probably when I had more to offer in my career than I might have had earlier in my career so uh, I, I miss I miss some of that there and you know it, it comes down to also uh, 
and, and, and Melba and I in particular, I don't know if this is true for you, Rosie, that we can acknowledge on a very basic level, there's a bunch of income you give up as well. And that's not a small issue uh, to, to do this work. If, if you're in private practice or uh, of any kind, um, uh, you, it takes up the, it takes, it takes time. And if time is not, if your money is not guaranteed, then you have to think about what the financial impact as well. Now I didn't lose any money uh, because uh, <laughs> I did. I didn't because I stepped down from being a vice president, and so yeah. I was pulled out. And I was a tenured professor all along, and they were very kind to me and and let me have a half load and paid me full pay. So I I was very very fortunate that. And being a vice president is a twenty four hour day job anyway, so I was gone a lot anyhow. What I gave up was energy. I was just so tired when I got through. You were you you were you were sort of out of steam by the end of December. Yeah. yeah. One word or phrase. How would you describe your fellow APA presidential peers on this call? Awesome. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> yeah. What what they said. <laughs> we follow what they said. <laughs> It has been a privilege. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. I sincerely apologize if we haven't had the opportunity to answer all of your questions. I will ask um, our panelists to do one last thing as Annalise and Carmen and Julie come back on to type in the chat box for everyone, if you're able to do so, any recommendations as far as readings or documentaries or resources? If there's anything that comes to mind, they might best be answered by putting them in the chat box because that was a question of one of our participants. And with that said, I thank you. It's been a blast. <laughs> wow. I, <laughs> this was just, truly incredible. Uh, thank you, Brandy and L Linda, for facilitating an awesome, awesome night. Hey, Julia and Melva, Rosie, Sandy, like hands in the air. I, I laughed. I got inspired. I got angry. And I might have peed in my pants a lot. <laughs> <laughs> My point Ditto. is, y'all had me laughing my ass off, <laughs> and I'm just so grateful for our community who showed up tonight. Um, so many messages you left us with, going back to our roots, promoting like equity and justice in our society, impacting systems, uh, using our expertise to promote justice and equity, spending time with our international counterparts and taking those relationships, building them as far as we can, relying on science, but making science and practice and advocacy so much broader. I mean, you have filled our cups and overflowing. Um, our goal tonight was to feel like we were in your hotel suite after a long ass APA meeting. <laughs> And I think we got that. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just uh, turn it over to Carmen and Julia for any final thoughts. And then I'll come back and tell you all about our next webinar in this series. Carmen? Just very quickly, not even two sentences, just feel so grateful and have you know interacted with all of you at so many different levels and just feel, I don't know, I, I, it's really hard to really fully express, but I just feel incredibly grateful and so happy that so many people were impacted by your history tonight. It, it was really, really important to, to chronicle this information for everybody that's coming forward in our future in the next 75 years. So thank you. It means a lot. Thanks, Carmen. Julia. Yes, and ditto, ditto, ditto. Thank you so much. Loved every minute of it. And I also loved looking at the chat and seeing how much um, everybody was interacting and connected and inspired. So thank you all. So just FYI, we will have a copy of the chat box. We will have a recording of this uh, webinar for you. Um, we will get that out to folks. Please share it. This is the her story of our profession. And I think we all know what a special night it was tonight. Um, our next webinar series is, uh, that's gonna be June 18th with Dr. Bettina Love. This one is only an hour and y'all, this one, 
it ain't going to be recorded. So sign up and we have up to 500 slots. Dr. Bettina Love, uh, she'll be speaking on We Want to Do More Than Survive, the title of her new book, Implications of Abolitionist Teaching in the Pursuit of Educational Freedom for Counseling Psychologists. Folks, the roots of our profession are awesome. We've got 75 years of an important trajectory and still there are things that are true. Parsons was a eugenicist, right? Our counseling theories don't go back and look at where counseling theory started, which was not with Freud or William James. It was with the continent of Africa, where all human migration started. That is where counseling started, right? So, um, you know, this is the next, tonight and this next few webinars really gives us the opportunity to start questioning uh, everything we've learned everything we wanna hold on and say yes, and things that we might need to shed and things that we might need to build. On July 16th, we have a panel of amazing community uh, organizers, Mariah Moore, Jay Celestial Shavers, and Tony Michelle Williams, moderated by M. Matsuno. And they will be talking about when we fight, we, we win, implications for counseling psychology from black trans intersectional liberation movements. Let me tell you all, in COVID-19, we are learning what we already knew in counseling psychology happens in the world. And so we've got such prime opportunities to learn with mm -hmm. and from community organizers who can help us point the way. Let's give one more round of applause, like in the chat box, <laughs> the hands in the air, Rosie, Melba, Sandy, Linda, Brandy, we love you. We love you. And we want to give a special shout out. We couldn't get all the names of the counseling psych, uh, uh, conference organizing committee and steering committee in the chat box. So we just want to honor you and we'll find a way to do that in our next webinar series. This was two years of organizing that we appreciate your labor. We hope everyone has a wonderful night. Mwah! Love you. And we will see you on June 18th with Dr. Love. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Great job. Organizing. Thank you. Good night, everyone.